Nineteen. Grocery cart. My son found a grocery cart in the creek today. He plays in the woods and the creek behind our house a lot. The first time we came to see our house, as it was being built, he was only an infant. I carried him down the hill to the creek in the baby pack on my back. I remember standing there and thinking, Nick, you'll have a lot of fun down here. His fingers were so small then. There are a lot of things to marvel at about a baby, but it was his fingers that amazed me the most. They were so small, not even bony then. Now that he's nine, his fingers are much more like my own, longer and skinny. He even has dirty fingernails like I did at that age. I remember the first time he got a cut on his finger. He was two. His mother wasn't home, and he made me feel strong and useful as I swept him up onto the counter, put a band-aid on the cut with a kiss, and gave him M&Ms. I followed Nick and his friend G down to the creek where they had found the grocery cart. I like G. Nick met him in Taekwondo class. The first time I saw G was at their test for their green belts. I watched as G put his fist right through a board with this blood-curdling scream. It was like a Bruce Lee movie, if Bruce Lee was an eight-year-old. I could hardly believe it. Nick broke a board that day, too, but I could tell he felt more confident after seeing G do it first. They were good friends like that. The grocery cart is upside down and in one of the deeper parts of the creek. Deep for this creek is three feet or so. The wheels stick up in the air and look a little ridiculous. The seat and the handle of the cart are submerged, but I can recognize the name of the grocery store where we shop stamped on them. We go up there every weekend. Bad teenagers probably did this, my son says. In my son's world, it's teenagers who are always misbehaving. I find his moralizing a little amusing, but if it keeps him from getting into the trouble I did as a teenager, I don't mind. Vandals, G echoes. I'm glad they have consciences. They are good kids. The best. Better than I was. I watch them move around the banks, assessing the situation. Nick, in his bright red windbreaker, looks a little out of place among the softer earth tones of the woods. What are you guys going to do? I ask. Nick looks at G and then he says, Let's take it out. Yeah, G says. That might take some work. It's really wedged in there, boys. We can do it, Nick continues. We've got all day and we know the creek. Maybe they'll give us a reward if we give it back. Maybe we can make it into a go-kart, G said. No, G, Nick says. We should return it to its rightful owners. It's the right thing to do. Who am I to argue with that? Good luck, boys. Call me if you need any help. Back at the house, I help my wife, Elaine, with her own Saturday morning project. She is putting lining onto the pantry shelves, so she's pulled everything out of the pantry and set it on the kitchen table. Canned soups, beans, sweet potatoes, bags of corn chips, crackers, and peanut butter sit on the table before me. White potatoes, garlic, and onions are on the chair across from me, beside the roll of plastic lining and scissors Elaine is using. Breakfast cereals rise from the counter like a city skyline. The dog walks by, sniffs the detergents and the toilet cleaners on the floor, then moves on. Nothing interesting there. His treats are out of his reach on the counter. Elaine is placing the lining on the shelves and smoothing out the bumps with her hand. She is crouched, balanced on her tiptoes with her knees bent. She looks like a dancer about to take a leap. The position opens a gap in her clothing at the small of her back. Her hair is in a ponytail. She isn't wearing makeup and is in just shorts and an old t-shirt. She'd never go out in public like this, but strangely, I find her beautiful as is. Maybe it's because she wouldn't let anyone else see her like this. I guess there is some security and intimacy in these domestic chores. We met at my first office job. I was selling equipment to restaurants. I grew up working in my parents' cafe after Dad got sober, left his corporate job, and opened it up with my mother. I used that job to pay for college and had worked in the front and back of restaurants since. We met when I was just a young, funny-looking guy with an eye patch trying to make the shift from a blue-collar to a white-collar job. I'm glad she met me then and not before. 
We actually attended the same university during overlapping years, but our lives then were not overlapping. She was living in dorms and doing work study in the library. Me, I was in cramped off-campus housing, living among empty cases of beer and cigarettes, fighting with frat boys and studying between deliveries in the back of my parents' cafe. Compared to this one, I was living in a horrid world at the time. Binge drinking, promiscuous sex, drugs, drunken fights, all the things you try to protect your child from. How parents can send their kids to college is a mystery to me. I take comfort in the idea that it is years away for Nick. I hear the kids rummaging around in the garage. I go outside and see that they are looking for ropes. They find some jump ropes that they decide will suit their purpose and then go back to the creek. I change my clothes, gas up the mower, and mow the lawn. It takes an hour. Afterwards, I use the trimmer to trim the edges of the yard along the sidewalk. I'm afraid I'm not quite as good at it as some of my neighbors, whose yards look more like carpets than lawns. But I'm not sure I care enough to put the time and energy into it. I'd rather help Elaine. Elaine sets up a card table and we have lunch outside on the back porch, since the kitchen table is still covered with the debris of her pantry operation. We have turkey and cheese sandwiches with apples and oranges. I call the boys who return without the cart. I see their shoes and pancuffs are muddy. How's the salvage operation going, boys? It's a lot tougher than we thought. There's a tree fallen across the creek that's really in the way, Nick reports. It's really heavy, too, G says around a bite of his sandwich. You guys look like you're getting pretty muddy, Elaine says. The boys are not sure how to react. They can sense her disapproval, but as far as they can see it, they are still doing the right thing in salvaging the grocery cart. We can't help it, Nick says. G becomes quiet, as most kids do when their friend's parents are not happy with them. Hey, it's not the end of the world. Just wrap some trash bags around your legs and feet like waters. Then you can walk right into the water, I say. Yeah, that's a radical idea, Nick says. I chuckle under my breath at the fact that the word Radical is making a comeback. But Elaine looks at me as if I've just suggested that they parachute from the roof with bedsheets. Sydney? It's okay. I used to do it all the time when I was a kid. It works fine. If it doesn't, I'll do all their laundry, I say. Elaine shakes her head, but she's smiling, so I know she's decided to trust me. She says to the boys, make sure you have some fruit, too. They tear into their oranges and talk to each other about all the new parts of the creek they can reach, now that they have discovered a way to walk through the water using the trash bag trick. After lunch, I show the boys how to secure the tops of the bags underneath their knees with rubber bands from the newspaper. I offer to help them with the cart, but Nick says, It's all right, Dad. I think we've got it now. I help Elaine finish the shelves and then go back outside to haul some dead branches out of the wood that will make good firewood in the winter. By the time I have a sizable pile, it's late afternoon, and I go out onto the deck to start a fire for the grill. Afternoons are my favorite time of day on the weekend. There's a feeling of fullness after a hard day of work and the promise of an evening, perhaps lovemaking, and soon another day. I work on the grill and find myself thinking of a man with a blind son I once saw on the subway. I'm not sure why they popped into my head then, but they just did. I remember that it had been interesting to watch them. The son seemed happy and comfortable, despite his white eyes rolling this way and that in his sockets. The father, he seemed stern. Maybe it was out of self-consciousness or even shame, which would be sort of sad, I reflect. When the son stepped too close to the edge of the subway platform, the father scolded him. He guided his son's hand, which was holding a white cane, so that the end of the cane moved over the bumps at the edge of the platform. I had never realized until then that those bumps were signals to blind people that they were nearing the ledge. Would I be able to reprimand a blind child, I wonder? That father didn't seem too sympathetic to his son at the time, but maybe familiarity eliminates sympathy. Maybe it was just tough love. Someday the father would be gone, and his son would have to navigate the subways alone. The reprimand came from a place of love, even a fear of loss. I feel a pit in my stomach at the thought just then, and suddenly feel like I have some insight into the dad. The blind boy never stopped smiling, though. That was important. The father was doing something right. I watched the charcoal catch fire and turn red. 
Shortly before dinner, I hear the unmistakable rattle of a grocery cart rolling along the sidewalk. I go out front to take in the boys in their victory march. They wave at me, triumphant from behind the cart, their heads just as high as the handle. One of the wheels can't turn because of mud caked on it. Algae hangs in green strands all over the cage, yet the steel glints in the afternoon sun like a prize trophy. The boys allow me to hose it down for them. G goes home for dinner. Elaine and I listen to Nick's account of the rescue operation all through dinner. When I get home from work Monday, we'll take it up to the grocery store in the car. With G, right? Nick asks. Of course. You all are a team. Nick asks to be excused so he can go try to get one of the wheels on Jan from the mud. That night, after a bath, he sleeps like a log wrapped in blankets, dreaming of creeks, jump ropes, trash bag waters, and grocery carts. Monday, I get home at a quarter to six. I drive up to the house, listening to my books on tape, to find Nick sitting by the cart in the driveway. He must be excited to return it and collect a reward. I take off my suit jacket, roll up my sleeves, and lift the cart into the trunk. I use some bungee cords to close the trunk lid down on it and secure it. We pick up G at his house and drive to the grocery store. In the back seat, the boys speculate about what kind of reward they might get. I pull up in the loading lane and lift out the cart. The boys take over from there and push the cart inside. They say they want to do it themselves. I tell them that is great and to just ask for the manager when they find an employee. No one else is pulling up to the loading lane, so I lean up against the car, cross my arms, and watch the boys through the windows. I see the boys walk up to a woman behind a cash register and ask her for the manager. She picks up a phone next to her station and pages her boss on the overhead speakers. The boys wait beside the cart. G has his hands in his pockets. Nick has his on the cart. A tall, balding man in about his fifties, in blue pants and striped shirt, wearing a key card on his belt, comes up to them. His face is lined, and he does not get that smile that some adults wear when talking to kids. I feel a knot in my stomach for the boys. The manager gives off a grumpy vibe. I can tell Nick picks up on it. But Nick perseveres. I can't hear what he is saying, but he gestures to G in the cart, recounting how they had found it. The man listens without saying anything. He looks serious, like he is mediating a disagreement between feuding employees or something. I wonder if he doesn't believe the boys or something. He asks them where their parents are. I can lip-read that much. Nick points to me and the man glances my way. For a moment, I can see what he sees as my reflection is staring back at me in the window. A dad in a collared shirt, his tie loosened, his sleeves rolled up, his hair with flecks of premature gray, and an eye patch. Who knew what the manager thinks of that? But hopefully I give the kid's story some credibility as a responsible-looking guardian. But I don't want to intervene. Nick is feeling out his autonomy. I respect that. The manager reaches into his pocket and pulls out a bunch of keys that he spins around his fingers, like a nervous tick, then shoves them back in his pocket. The motion reminds me of a gunslinger twirling his gun for some reason. It was an empty gesture, though, done out of habit, without much thought or meaning, I realize. He shakes hands with Nick and G, then walks away, pushing the cart into a line of other identical ones. Nick and G sense that they had been dismissed. Their orphaned cart returned to its herd. They trudge out to the car and get in the back seat without saying a word. I start the car and wait until they are belted in. Did he give you a reward? I ask. No, Nick says. He didn't walk back to the office to get you something? He said, thank you very much, and that he hoped it wasn't too much trouble. Then he said to have a nice day. Like the teacher does when you go home for the day, G says. It was just like that, Nick says. He was grumpy. He was, Nick agrees. I can tell they are both disappointed. If I had been that manager, I would have just pulled out a fiver and given it to the kids for their honesty. We should have made it into a go-kart, G says. No, we did the right thing. We returned it to its owner, Nick says like a little sage, like he is trying to convince himself. We drop off G. As we drive down our block, I say, Well, I think you and G deserve a reward, Nick. 
What you did was really good, and I'm proud of you. Why didn't he give us a reward, though? How do you tell your son that the world isn't fair? That sometimes you do the right thing, and that's its own reward? We'll get ice cream this weekend, I say, to buy myself some time. But it doesn't matter to him. Things that far away don't, to kids. He didn't even seem to care, Nick says. I know, I know, but I do. Your mom and I do. We're real proud of you. He smiles a bit after that. I still want to take him for ice cream, though. He deserves it. Nick is quiet at dinner, like he is trying to process his afternoon. Afterwards, I do dishes and talk to Elaine about how hard it is for kids to be good in today's world. Elaine listens and drinks some lemon ginger tea before she kisses me and heads upstairs to put Nick to sleep. I follow her up when I am finished. She is getting ready for bed herself. I go to check on Nick. He is sound asleep, but his face looks different from the night before. It looks as if he has worn his disappointment to bed. It was his first great hurt from a world that will just keep hurting him. I know then that my words can only ameliorate it so much. I'm sorry, Nick. I'm sorry. I wish I could protect you, your heart, your idealism, from it all. Keep you precious and innocent. I wish I could give everyone who ever disappointed you and will ever disappoint you a beatdown. Bad teenagers, vandals, grumpy managers, even me. You're better than me. You're better than us all.